my brother Ed. He's on a rare visit to Ireland. He's a very busy man. What is it again that you do, Ed? I'm an ecologist. Ecologist, eh? I do lots of international work, especially about air pollution. <laughs> so uh, the main thing I look at is how nitrogen pollution affects ecosystems. And I just wanted to talk to Tim a bit now about wildflowers, about the wildflowers that we have on the roof and maybe comparing it with other parts of the farm here. So Tim, if you have a look close up down at the, at the vegetation here. Yeah. Because we're on the roof of our house again. It's kind of the wrong time of year to be looking at flowers, but here we are. And it's mid-winter, yep. Still tell a lot of things. So this is ribwort plantain. Here we have some red clover. And there's a wood rush there, a bit of luzula. Um, some, this one here is false strawberry. So within quite a small area... Here's an ash tree. We've got a whole lot of species. Yeah. Um, and mosses. Now, in a minute, we'll go and look at some of the pasture, where, which has had lime and manure and those things to make it more fertile. But the thing is, really, it's infertile up here because the soil is a bit thin and it's been washed out over the years. And that's kind of why we have so many species. So you're saying that... Um, Soils that are not fertile have more variety, is that right? More exactly. biodiversity. That's it. So why is that? Well, it's a little complicated. It's to do with how fast things grow and how fast they fill the gaps. So when you have grazers or people just walking on the, on the grass, they make little gaps in the vegetation. And if those gaps close over really fast, because it's fertile and the fast-growing species dominate, it means that you don't get all of these little, small species. And actually, this is a global problem. All over the world, the plants that grow in open, uh, infertile habitats are getting a bit fertilised out because of all the nitrogen pollution. So the stuff we do about burning fossil fuels, driving our cars about, burning coal, that makes lots of nitrogen oxides go into the air and also farming, especially intensive poultry and pig production, produces lots of ammonia that goes up. And what goes up must come down. So the whole landscape, especially in quite populated places like Europe, is being fertilised. From the air, without people being even aware of it, it's falling down in the rain, is it? Or That's it, yeah. yeah. So some comes down in the rain, some is just kind of deposited as a gas, but especially in the kind of wetter places, in the mountains and places that really should be infertile, they're getting a lot of nitrogen from atmospheric pollution. It sounds like it's a good thing to, to have fertile soil. Well, yeah, if you want to have good grazing for your livestock, this is just what you want. Or even if you want to grow trees, maybe fix carbon from the atmosphere, that's all good. But the thing is, for wildlife, for wildflowers and all the little creatures that depend on the wildflowers, um, it's too much of a good thing. So, like I say, it's making everything fertile and that favours just a few species. So, Tim, let's go and look at some other bits of the farm where we can see the contrast with somewhere that's more fertile. OK, so here we're looking at a bit of the lawn, actually. This is where the geese live. And I guess because it's, um, it's got the kind of the geese manure coming in, Maybe the geese are fed on grain? Do you, do you buy grain? We, well, we buy in some poultry food for them, so that's importing nutrients, isn't it? That's exactly right. So mm -hmm. that nutrient is getting into the system, and here we have much fewer species. There's a bit it of rye like grass. like healthy grass. Oh, sure. Yeah, and so this is looks productive. nice and green and productive, but you're saying that there aren't so many species, is that that's right? That's it. So there's kind of a trade-off. If you want to have it productive, then it's good to have lots of fertiliser, obviously, nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium, all the things you need. But it's just not growing so many things. So here we have some white clover and some rye grass and some creeping buttercup. But I reckon there's only three or four species here. And those are the species that grow really fast, close the gaps really fast and stop the other things coming in. The roof had many more species on the, um, even though the ground is poorer precisely because the ground is poorer. So, obviously, if you have a little farm, you want to have fertility and good grazing for your livestock. But maybe if there are some bits that are not so fertile, you might want to leave them infertile. Don't fertilise everywhere. And even if in the traditional systems, what you'd have is grazers bringing fertility out of a lot of the landscape, and then at night they'd be kept in a corral or a little hold where um, 
that they kind of concentrate the fertility. So that might be where you grow your crops in the following year, or it's just good to produce lots of grass. So you're um, collecting the fertility from your entire farm, but concentrating it in a certain area where you want to grow maybe your vegetables the next year, or a hay crop or something like that. But the bit that is becoming more depleted in nutrients will become a better habitat for a wider variety of species. That's just it. So the wildflowers that you'd get, so you get more of the wildflowers for the reasons I was explaining, more gaps for them to come into. And the wildflowers, having a good variety of them, supports a good variety of other things. So you have specialist insects that feed on each species, maybe specialist fungi, and the whole web of life is depending on this variety of wildflowers. It's so interesting, isn't it? I just love it all. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew a bit more. So let's go and look at some other bits. So here we are in the vegetable garden. And here, Tim and Sandra have been putting lots of muck on. These are the broad beans just got in. And this is what you want. Here, it needs to be fertile. You want vegetables to grow fast, to shade out the weeds, and give you a nice crop. So fertility is great. Just not everywhere. OK, here we are on a place that has almost no soil at all. Yeah, you can see the rock is coming nearly to the surface here. That's bedrock, that goes all the way down. And there's just a smidgen of soil on the top, but what's growing in it? Well, here we have some quite special things. This is a little stone crop and a bit of sheep soil. Mm. So these are things that only grow on very thin soil. And if they were, if you were out in the field, they would be shaded out by the tall grasses, especially, and things like the white clover creeping buttercup. It's nice to have a variety of habitats, isn't it? It's nice to have some areas that are fertile that you need for your livestock, some areas that you kind of keep infertile, and they support more of a variety of wildflowers. And not just wildflowers, all the other species that follow on from plant species. Yeah, all the rich tapestry of life. Cool. Sedums and mosses. And is that foxglove down there? This is coming. Ivy, and there's something, this is there's something. Oh yeah, is that a baby gorse, I think. Is it? Oh, it doesn't look a bit like gorse, does it? This one here is called Blinks. Um, there's some self heal. I think that's a little marsh bird's foot trefoil. So again, having a variety of habitats makes it more interesting. If we had everything drained and fertilised, as has happened to most of the landscape, we'd only have those three or four species that like it like that. It's a pretty lichen. Yeah. Is this electric? It's not on. <laughs> so this is extreme um, habitat, isn't it? This is quaking bog. There's so much moisture here. It's definitely quaking. Really, we're on a pond. We're standing on a pond with a layer of roots and rushes and things over the top. Uh, here in the bog, we have different species again. This one's called water avens. It's, it's died off now, but in the spring it's so pretty. It has these weird metallic purple flowers. It is. It's beautiful. What else? Some other is things that I don't know. Is that down there? Yeah, that could be a it's, it's, it's mid-winter and we're still finding plants to recognise. see. Oh yeah, definitely mint. Smell that, Tim. This one's a marsh bed straw. Little white starry flowers in the summer. After a, a while, with all the vegetation dying and rotting down, it will build up a layer of organic matter and then it'll get really acid. So it won't have any connection to the water underneath. And then you'll start getting the carnivorous plants and specialist orchids, real bog species. Look at that beautiful lichen in there, it's a bluey grey one. Yep, some sort of peltigera, that one. So this is more of a fen or a marsh, but when you get to true bog, then that's really infertile. And you get specialist species that like it to be really infertile. Making a great noise, isn't it? <laughs> it's a little bit kind of worrying because it might fall right through. As far as we can tell, it's about uh, 12 feet deep. And oh, there's something with a little seed pot on it. Yeah, that might be the water avens, I guess. 
and this one that's angelica so um, yeah there's the leaf of the angelica hang on i'll zoom in zoom and zoom out and this one here is the flower spike of it from yeah from the back in the summer if you cut the stems when they're young and candy them you get this kind of candied bright green angelica but you have to be careful with umbilicas some of them are very poisonous oh, yeah here's some sphagnum so in this really wet boggy bit we have a special moss this is sphagnum moss and this is what makes the kind of peat that you, you buy in garden centers or something to grow grow your plants in uh, and what's special about this moss is that it's really good at holding water so it kind of sucks up the water, keeps it wet all the time, so it gets more and more boggy. It's a cool part of our place, isn't it? But we don't let the horses in here, they wouldn't come in anyway. Now, this might be our least fertile patch of land, because it doesn't grow cabbages and carrots and potatoes and things, but it is growing all sorts of things, isn't it? Yeah, and the real specialists are growing here. So, I mean, maybe it's not so useful. But isn't it nice to have a whole variety of wildflowers and dragonflies and special moths that will grow in this habitat? 